Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Again, to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest, I'm Bruce Broussard, uh, your host, and joining me today is this young man, as far as I'm concerned, I, I really support him. He's uh, He's been very active out in the community and and on issues and whatever, and it's very important to, to be involved, and it's not an easy task for that matter of trying to make a living and at the same time being involved. And I'm talking about Cameron Whitten. He's with me here. You've seen him before. As you know, he's run for mayor, and he's, he's run for secretary of, uh, no, tre state treasurer, and uh, he's been very much involved with the uh, uh, folks downtown and Occupy and the homeless, and he's really been involved. And, and it really takes a special kind of a mindset to really to do that. You know what I mean? It really does. And I mean, I've been involved in a number of the years, but but in all due respect, you you give up certain things too when you when you're involved. You know, whether it be whether you're working for someone or you've got a business or whatever, people tend to take it. You know, from the standpoint of uh, pros and cons and whatever. But it's very important. But it's very important for for folks to get involved. And so I. But you can do it in another way, and that is you can be well read. Uh, you can read uh, your, your local newspapers, uh, or you can look, look at a little news sometimes as opposed to just the soap operas and the like. But, uh, but try to be involved. It's very important because a lot of things are happening, and, and it affects you. And, and, and it may be at the gas pump. A lot of times if you don't know anything about the gas pump, and all of a sudden, you know, the people are living on limited income and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, something can be done about it. But the fact of the matter is if you're not involved, the folks on the other end of it, i.e. the producers and whatever, can do what they want to do. Not to say that you know we're, we're this entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship, but the fact of the matter is to keep things balanced, you got to be involved. Okay, well, with that, what we're going to do uh, today is that uh, uh, we're going to spend some time with Cameron, kind of get a little update and what's going on out in out in the real world here in the in, the, in Oregon in the port in Portland metropolitan area in the community, and we'll touch a little basis a little bit about from a national perspective too, and we're going to open up the lines. We're going to open up the lines for you. And hopefully you would like that you you participate again participate if you got something on your mind in regards to how we're talking about it or you've got something that you want to announce let's do that i might add to that welcome Cameron. welcome I, Bruce. fine fine i might add as, as an announcement as you know if you're a senior like myself and whatever and yeah i get all sorts of mail and you feel in regards to the fact that you've got to you got to come up with your own health plan and that's that's in there right now and it's it's coming to a ahead, if you will, and only a few more days, like six days, by the time we appear on the show next week, uh, that's it. Then they'll just, they'll have to assign something to you, and, and you never know what that's all about. But the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, you know, respond. I mean, call up ARP, you can call up ARP, AARP, or, or you can call up Multnomah County Health Department, or anybody for that matter, but do get your plan. I mean, that came up in the Bush administration, and you would think, in all due respect, with, with seniors and this, that, and the other, and we got baby boomers, and many many folks are having living in uh, li limited income, really tough situation, maybe at home. And and my point is that you would think that the government, if if anything, if they if they could do something, they would go on and get the best plan for seniors across the board. Well, I get them into a situation where they're they're dealing with about seven or eight com competitors. You know what I mean? Uh, they're not that, that articulate, but they do need the care, and um, and it's, it's there for them. Unfortunately, they they've got this. Uh, this, this this private enterprise thing, if you will, and it's whatever. So, so if you if you got a family member or you you've got an aunt that's old or this that and the other, check in on them to see whether or not they they sign off on their health plan because otherwise they won't have they won't they won't be able to have a health plan. I think along that particular line, that's one uh, that's one major major announcement. I think is very very important. And then the other thing is that um, naturally we're coming in right into the to the holidays for that matter. Uh, be cognizant about the fact that there are a number of folks who are who make a living during that particular time, you know, whether it be making sure you secure your presence and this, that, and the other, and and at the same time, don't don't uh, answer too many phone calls. People looking for monies or multi-level marketing and all kinds of different kinds of issues that are trying to get your money. Okay, so be very careful and cognizant about the fact things happen over the phones. I heard, in fact, another heard heard a piece about the internet. They said it was so often change your change your password. I mean, change change your change your email address, you know, I don't know whether it's six months or whatever, 
but they, you know, it's like anything else. You got enemies that are out there that are looking for checkbooks and any other kinds of things, you know, in terms of to get in there. So if you're a senior and you, you don't know what you're doing and you and you basically doing your finances on your, on your on your uh, on the internet, you know, hey, that can happen. Some things can happen to you. Anyway, that's about the size of it. But now, now I've talked enough. I'm gonna get Cameron in here. We'll see if we can get him involved. Okay, Cameron, <coughs> what's going on? Talk to us. It's raining outside. <laughs> <laughs> it is raining. We got quite a bit of rain here. A little bit. Yeah, but yes, very much so. <laughs> so let's talk about let, let, let's let's bring up the date. Let's talk about the national election for that matter. Okay. Yeah, uh, the presidential election. Okay. You know? And uh, uh, as you know, the way you got, with President Obama now is, is, is Obama is, won. He won. I don't know yet. I, I think that there's still you know there's this issue of it's still basically going the same way that you got the you got the uh, you got the issue between Congress you know yep. and, and the House of Representatives. That's gonna get fixed soon. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe. maybe. Jeff Merkley, he's working on it. Oh, just just making it. Yeah, he has this whole campaign that I think he started in 2010 to reform the filibuster. You got to reform the filibuster. Because it's always taken a, a supermajority to get anything passed right, through right, the Senate. Right, right. It's even taken a supermajority to get somebody, you know, confirmed as an appointee to mm -hmm. any, you know, executive bureau. Mm -hmm. And so Jeff Merkley's saying, well, we need to make sure that if you really are opposed to this thing, you won't have to be in the chamber. Right. And two, you have to be speaking. You actually right. have to put some and skin in the game. You have to be there. Exactly. You yeah, can't yeah. just be a right. ghost bench right. warmer person saying the process is wrong. You have to be involved right. in the process. Right. So it's actually, not a super majority. It'll be a 51 percenter. No, no, no. The filibuster is still going to yeah, exist. But, but still, 51%, but, though. I mean, 51% would be the vote, I mean, as I understand it. Otherwise, you have to have the 60 plus. Yeah, that's the supermajority. That's the supermajority. Yes. 60 plus. Yes. But they're going to they eliminate that also, too. No, they're reforming that. They're going to reform and that. And so, so what basically, would be the, what would be the... the Senate and the House, they can filibuster if the minority group feels like the bill that right. is being voted on right. is too extreme. Right. And basically, since the, the, the division between the chambers is so close, nobody has the majority to break the right. filibuster. Right. And so they're basically saying that we need this filibuster to be fair. You can't just filibuster everything and you not actually be providing a good reason and a good effort to okay. why you have your filibuster. So no one person can stop the whole bill. Right now, the one one person can stop it in the, in the Senate. Exactly, they'd right. have to have like iron lungs. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that, that's a, that's a very interesting piece aspect of it. Okay, so uh, other than that, what do you hear about? You, you're out there, you know, constantly with people on the streets on an ongoing basis and talking to people, going to various events and whatever. Are, are people aware of what's going on? In, in, I think people really do pay attention on the national stuff. You know, what's going on in Israel. Pakistan and its, you know, acceptance to the Security Council, mm -hmm. stuff with the fiscal cliff, Obamacare. Those things are definitely a yeah, part of the broader they going dialogue. In small groups, uh, various organizations, uh, like Occupy, for instance. Now, that is an organization, right? You and, can call it that. <laughs> now, I call they, it a movement. Now, do they move? <clears throat> do they meet? I mean, is it a, is it a formal group? I'm sure they still do general assemblies, and there's definitely a lot of affinity groups or offshoots where mm -hmm. people really focus directly on what they want to work on. Mm -hmm. Especially, you can see right outside of this building, there are all those lawn signs with the red hand that say, don't move out. That is actually a part of We Are Oregon and the Occupy Northeast Black Working Group. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are doing foreclosure resistance action really trying to highlight what's been going on with our MERS system and, um, you know, unethical, possibly illegal foreclosures going on mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. And it's really been interesting to see how people are acting as individuals who are mm -hmm. kind of acting outside of the government to address the problems that they want to see fixed. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's interesting about foreclosure. The interest rate has really gone down quite a bit. Yeah. It's running about two and a half, only they say 3% aspect of it. So now is the time to buy, you know what I mean? You know, now is the time to refinance. But naturally, you got to, in some many cases, you got to have a job and you got to still yeah. meet the criteria of the bank. But I understand the government has a program such that you can maybe offset some of those issues. Yeah. Am I right? The, the other problem still is with the regulations back in place right. that made sure that people have to have a good credit rating. Right. And a lot of people 
got their credit rating screwed mm -hmm. after the whole bubble. And so right. it's going to take a very long time, even though we have lower interest rates, for people to get back on our feet. It's just the way our economy works. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I guess you got to have that, that score, right? You got to have I think it was about 700 or so. It's 700 or something. And that's pretty tough to get sometimes. It is, yeah. For folks and whatever. And then there's the, the whole issue about the middle class aspect of it. You guys still mm -hmm. have folks that are, and then, you know, and then they're looking forward. And then they, yeah, all of a sudden we're looking at a situation where if they don't pass this bill, all of a sudden, you know, people are going to really be having a tough time, right? Yeah. The, the, the unemployment rate yeah. aspect of it. That's yeah. going to be a tough situation yeah. aspect of it. And so this cliff thing, I guess, what is it, about another, what, three or four months or something like that? I thought they said 31 days. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like that. You're right there on, yeah. on that. So what do you think is going to happen on that? What, what's your feel? Are you hear anything? Well, there's been a bunch of Republicans who have kind of been bucking the, I forget what they called it, the pledge, mm -hmm. the anti-tax pledge that mm -hmm. uh, Grover Norquist has made a lot of Republicans sign on to. So it's been really interesting to see how this is no longer becoming a partisan issue. It's really about the way our economy functions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm pretty sure that Obama's agenda ultimately is going to succeed because nobody wants to see an absolute collapse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh. We know one of the things we're going to do is that, um, like I said, <laughs> we're just talking in general and uh, we may just start off early, you know what I mean, and just open up the line and just continue to talk. Okay. And we would encourage you to uh, give us a call. We'll put the we'll put the number on the screen, and um, and if you want to get involved in, in whatever point that Cameron might or I might have brought up, you can just give us a call. call. Call us on that number, and and we can have a discussion. Maybe there might be some elected officials out there that might want to chat a little bit about uh, uh, what's coming up in the legislature. Or what else would they be doing with watching you, TV? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know. So let's let's do that. Or maybe there's some folks we've been talking about the whole issue of. Uh, of uh, Hayden Allen, if you will, there's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of issues down at Hayden Allen, and most mm -hmm. recently, uh, uh, I think Mayor Adam was trying to put together a piece that it wasn't uh, it wasn't too favorable with the folks, exactly, and was voted down, if you will. No, it wasn't voted down. Was it wasn't voted down? No, it me. was stalled. It was stalled. Yeah. So the Commission of Planning and Sustainability, which is a ten-person, I believe, right. citizen commission, right. okay. they basically looked at the new proposal that the mayor was providing, right. and they said, well, this definitely can't be put to a vote in December. Right. They're not saying that it can't be put to a vote ever, okay. but they're basically saying, Sam Adams, you, there's nothing so, else you so, can do about so Hayden Island. So stall down for a minute. Exactly. <laughs> okay, you know, just for a minute or so. But, but I, I figured that was going to happen anyway, you know, being being a lame duck kind of a person, if you will. It's been getting you know, people, really yeah, nasty it's been, it's lately. It's been really nasty, but the bottom line, at the end of the day, uh, yeah. uh, you know, it's unfortunate Sam is out. He's he's he spent his time. He's, he's spent four years, yeah. if you will. And yeah. and but it's interesting how 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 people the criteria for people running for office nowadays. You know what I mean in terms mm -hmm. of what their background is and this that and the other. And uh, you think the the mayoral race. You know, let's talk a little bit about that. The mayoral race with Jefferson Smith and and Charlie Hill aspect of it. And now we've got a newly elected mayor and Charlie Hill. And the Oregonian was very much involved early on with these folks, and and was it Eileen Eileen Brady? Mm -hmm. She was part of that process. That that was a threesome. We had other folks that were running too at the same time, but uh, it's interesting how the issues that both of them had issues. One was then actually with the whole issue with um, with Jefferson Smith uh, about the situation with the the woman, right, with the mm -hmm. female aspect of it in college, and then and then uh, uh, Charlie's. Um, uh, if, uh, was it residency? Yeah, yeah. In Washington, but they didn't play that quite a bit during that they time. They didn't. They didn't play that at all. And there was Eileen that was sitting there. And what would you think would have happened if they had played that real heavy? Do you think Eileen would have been one of the two, or maybe just the one? I don't know. It. I don't think the media had as much impact as people might think they did. You know, Oregonian endorsed George Bush. Did it mean that? Oregon actually, you know, mm -hmm. voted for him. Mm -hmm. But I definitely look at what happened with Eileen's campaign, mm -hmm. a lot of what happened when Jim Francisconi ran against Tom Potter. Right. Yes, he seemed to be the front runner. He was a front runner for pretty much the entire time. Jim Francisconi. Exactly. And he had the money. He had the money. He had, he had money. all the connections. Mm -hmm. And Tom Potter wasn't really mm -hmm. anything had anything to offer. Mm -hmm. But I think that people are really, really concerned about the influence of money in politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that here in Portland is definitely a nucleus where people do not feel like they can be represented by people With who raise too much money. Mm -hmm. So Eileen was the money part. 
And so the, so that is, let's just focus on the money piece and the violations over here, if you know, the, i.e. the idea yeah. of residency yeah. and the idea of what happened in college 20, 30 years or so ago yeah. didn't matter at the time. Yeah. But then when they had the runoff, then it mattered. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And the Oregonian was it, it endorsed Charlie early on in the in the situation, and they didn't endorse Eileen. You got me? And with the with the money, no, let's see, no, they didn't endorse her. They didn't endorse her. And then all of a sudden, you know, there we are with two folks. And then all of a sudden, they just everybody just oh, naturally. I say I say Oregonian because it's the largest newspaper in the state. It's yeah. basically it's our state newspaper. And but then all of a sudden, everybody just honed in on that, you know. And then at the, at the end of the day, we're going to make the point that, well, hey, look, we don't support either one. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't exactly that. No, I remember they kept doing editorials in support of Charlie. But then reporters, they were just like lampooning left and right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. But it became a very uninspiring. It wasn't, race it wasn't a clear end. support for any, any any one of the two individuals aspect of it. You think you think uh, you think um, uh, uh, Jefferson could have done something different with that? How, how how should he have responded with that issue? Because it was, I, it was about twenty <laughs> years later, whatever, when yeah. he did this piece. I what would have appreciated him being a lot more straightforward with the, you know, incident. And I definitely think that it was completely inappropriate for him to approach this woman. If I was in her, you know, mm. if I was in that doorway, if I was actually the woman having to enter the door to see Jefferson Smith on my doorstep, I would have felt intimidated. I would have felt like I was being threatened into silence. Mm. And I can understand uh, what led her to come out after the news and talk directly with reporters about the incident because I definitely think that it was not in the best interest of the citizens mm -hmm. and that the timing mm -hmm. of someone to go and talk to you know a previous victim when you know the media is about to release it, mm -hmm. it definitely didn't seem as genuine as a heartfelt apology. Mm -hmm. We know. The other thing is that we, we can use a rumor or whatever, rumors, rumors or whatever had it as, as if they say that uh, it was some of Charlie's people or Charlie's group that actually brought the issue to the table. Yeah. Fair? I think it's extremely fair. <laughs> that, that, that's a pretty good statement, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that was the case, now that's, that's another issue. So they sort of held back. Because when you think about it, too, when, you know, Jefferson's in the, in the legislature, why wasn't the issue brought up then? They're, they did do a story in the Tribune. I remember an old story in the Tribune. When he, when he ran it, when he ran for the legislature. Yeah, and it mentioned how he used to be involved in bar fights and things like that. Okay. But definitely, for some reason, wasn't. It wasn't at brought all up. In, a, yeah. Yeah, in, in the in the primary. It wasn't brought up at all. In, yeah, in the, in the initial piece, it wasn't brought up at all. But it, it wasn't, wasn't an really an issue at all. Yeah. And then, then it's gone. You know, Eileen, I, she had the money, this, that, and the other. She was out there. She was proactive, and she really, really tried to address many social issues and tried to address a lot of folks along that mm -hmm. line and really didn't t push her money from the standpoint mm -hmm. that she was just representing all business. And even from the business community, I mean, Charlie had that anyway, to the, the, the downtown business group, so to speak. In the you know, after the primary, PBA endorsed Eileen for the first part. For the first time? Yeah. Okay, okay. That's, that's a very interesting. So, so anyway, what do you think? Uh, you think we're going to have a, a very proactive uh, mayor in Charlie Hill? Is he going to do the job? Or? I think Charlie's going to be a great mayor. You think, think he's going to be a great mayor? Why, why do you say mayor. that? I, he understands Portland. Okay, and, he's been there. Yes, and he has demonstrated that he has values in what Portlanders need mm -hmm. and how he really believes in a strong transportation system, how he understands the need for pristine community centers. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's going to be the, the responsibility of the citizens to remind him that we still have to focus on East Portland. We still have to focus on equity. Mm -hmm. These things, you understand the way the nuts and bolts gov of government works. Right. Now, we need to remind you where you need to implement it at. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. You know, another area that, that, that I thought was interesting about Charlie's race was that uh, his stance on the whole issue of police. It was very interesting I mean, how he was sort of like challenging, challenging the police yeah. department. And uh, I think Jefferson, had, Jefferson Smith had gotten the the support and the mm -hmm. endorsement of Portland police. But then after the, there was too much pressure from the Oregonian and others about the, the, the incident that he'd gone in with yeah. Jefferson's woman, then they pulled their endorsement. Yeah. They pulled their endorsement aspect of it. And then, in all due respect, and the fire department, they pulled their endorsement of Jefferson Smith. Yeah. And then that was it, so to speak. 
But I wonder what. But but my, my point is, but but Charlie made a so Char, so they didn't endorse him either. They didn't endorse Charlie Hill. No. So that was interesting how he he just came out in the campaign, uh, suggesting that he wanted more community policing, which I think I think is a good thing. I mean that was pretty well. Uh, gener it generated early during the Tom Potter era yeah. aspect of it because Tom was that form former chief of police, and it just made a good sense. It just it does make good sense, you know, for guys to get out their cars, you know, play. I, re I remember those live days. in the community, yeah, live maybe in the community, <laughs> live in the community. There was a program at one point in time. There was purchase yeah. a home or whatever. But as far as I'm concerned, you don't you don't buy homes. As far as I'm concerned, to the law, you just make it part of the criteria for the job. You know, you divide the city into quadrants. And then you said, okay, fine, we got X number of jobs that are available. And I think it had to do with a lot of the bargaining, yeah. collective bargaining with yeah. the unions. But, you know, ultimately, we might get to that in but the it future. It would be a good mm -hmm. idea, though. It would be a good idea for them to move in the community. And, and then yeah. people are naturally concerned about their own families, you know, and so a lot of times they tend to live outside the city of Portland. I think the majority of them live outside the city of Portland. 25% live in sites. So it's about, Only yeah, three quarters. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah. quite a few quite a short. So hopefully that might be an area that he might be able to, to work with the, 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 the department. and But at the same time, communicate with the people in the population yeah. that they got to be more responsible. Yeah. You got know I me mean? be more responsible about community and and uh, and and not be a kind of a divisive kind of a situation exactly. as far as police is concerned because that is a tough tough job. It is. It's a very tough job. It is. Of it. And uh, so anyway, and then, then those who, who are going to commit the crime sometimes is maybe, maybe I mean the real criminals, if you will, maybe 1% or 2%. <laughs> <laughs> but, they're, but they're pretty well, they just sit back like whatever, you know what I mean? Say, oh, boom, I can get me a crime, no problem, I'll go to, I'll go to the institution or whatever, just come out and whatever. So my point is that the majority of the people need to know that you got to get involved in the, in the process aspect of yeah. it. So hopefully that, that's an area that Charlie can work something out on that piece aspect of it. Okay. Now, what about the other seats there sitting out there on the on the on the on the city of Portland? There, you got uh, let's see, we got was was the we got one, one was unopposed. What am I thinking about? That was he was unopposed, but he won in the primary. Well, that he won, was he won, but he was Steve really, Novick. Steve Novick. Yeah, yeah Steve Novick. Yeah, in fact, uh, Novick's a very interesting guy. You know, he is very interesting guy. He's I got think. us hooked. Yep, I think, I think he just I think he just got married too, if I'm not mistaken. He's other. He was just married. I think it was an announcement of he, some sort. Oh, he, he was in the process of getting married. Oh, I'm pretty sure he's in the process, process of, getting of getting married. married. But anyway, he's yeah. going to be getting married. But Steve's good. He got, he got a lawyer background, legal background. I think it's going to be very exciting on that council with Steve. He, yeah. He's, he's <laughs> a no-nonsense kind of a guy, and he will dig in. And, I have no idea what he's yeah. going to do. <laughs> it's be interesting to see. Because there's uh, so many things he's been talking the, the about. The assignments, you know what I mean, yeah. as far as um, well, what committees, uh, what, what areas he's going to be assigned to, and uh, and whether or not Charlie's going to hold all of the bureaus for a certain That's period of time. That's also going to be interesting. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, how long he's going to do that? I remember I remember Mayor Potter did it at one point in time. He held it for quite some time. I don't know who has the record along that particular line. But um, it, it does make a little sense sometimes. Uh, I think it makes good sense for a mayor to just sort of just kind of go around and meet the, meet the various heads of each of those departments. Just have the meetings, if you will, with each of those departments, kind of get a sense of where you're going, what have you done, et cetera. You know, dot the I's. You can't do it all by yourself, but you can do have staff that can sit around and talk about this stuff. And then after that, said, okay, fine. Now, when he meets with his commissioners, these folks, okay, I'm going to sign this to you, but these are some of the things I want you to address. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. That's what it is. Now he's a little bit more familiar. He or she would have been, well, in this particular case, it would be a he, Charlie, yeah. would be very familiar with it. I'm sure that he, he understands that because he had to go through that process yeah. during that particular time. So, we got Steve Novak, and then uh, our dear friend got uh, reelected. Re mm -hmm. uh, Amanda Fritz. Amanda Fritz. Yeah. Amanda Fritz. Now, very active in her campaign. Yeah, very interesting. She spent quite a bit of her money. She did. That That's quite a bit of money. It was. 300 Why grand. Why couldn't she have raised the money? What happened? It was her principal. Principal, but I mean, we elected her with publicly financed elections. After that was over, she said, well, I don't want to raise thousands of dollars from developers and special interests. She said that I want to have a campaign where I'm not asking for money. I'm just talking about ideas and being in the community. Okay. And that involved her spending her own money, which is great. She because was accepting 50 bucks, I think, was it? In the primary. In the general, she, she accepted she 250. But she didn't get the money. She did get money, but still, $50 yeah, but compared to somebody, you know, raising tens of thousands yeah. of dollars from unions and yeah. developers, you know, $50 will never be able yeah. to match unrestricted campaign mm -hmm. donations. What do you like about it? What, what are the things that you think 
it, it, it sort of like puts her out up front uh, of some of the other commissioners that she will be doing. What, what, like what area? I thought it was a really interesting race to watch. And it was really great across the Portland area. There were a lot of competitive races where it was a progressive woman against another progressive woman. I don't know any other area where it could have happened like it did in Portland. Happened for Mary Nolan's old seat, happened for Jefferson Smith's old seat, and then it happened also at city council. And I actually wrote a thank you letter to Mary Nolan because I feel like she is a very bright, qualified oh, very person. Bright. But she also knew the business community, and I thought. And when you look at, and when you look at the council itself, there's no one there to really represent business. You know, what I'm saying in terms of accessing. I mean, I know Fish and those guys, but the bottom line is that there was nobody there that that's going to be there representing business per se. Fair. Who's going to represent business? <laughs> you're, you're, you're I think business will represent business. That's why oh, they have man. all the resources for. Well, but, so. is, but you know, someone needs to be there as part of the council aspect. You know, when they go in discussions and this, that, and the other, you like to have some idea that you know someone is uh, speaking from from a, a position of quote of knowledge, if you will. Yeah. So that's what to me. Charlie's worked for the private sector. Yeah, but his posture now is a little different. You know, you know his his. his his, his, his goals not quite or whatever. Enough. Yeah, his is a little different now. I think uh -huh. he does. He, he he's come back from a, from a long way, from, mainly from contractors and this, that, and the other. You got me. Okay, look like we got a caller coming in here. Someone someone wants to talk to us a little bit about this. Okay, caller, you on the air? Your question or comment, please. Teresa Jill, I uh, just recently moved here from California. Yes, um, I've been here about a year now, and um, I like. Uh, some of the things, Cameron, that you've been doing, um, I commend you for that. I see you out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just have some concerns about the, um, or if you guys have ever heard of um, any comments about the traffic signals or the crosswalks mm -hmm. and a lot of the jaywalking and the hit and runs that are going on, if there's ever been any talks of maybe doing something to, mm -hmm. uh, to help with that. Thanks. First off, uh, welcome to Portland, and, and I hope you uh, you'll have a good stay here. And and it's very it's a very neat city, very yeah. neat city. And Thank we, you. We Thank welcome you. you. Thank you for coming for, for being with us. I tell you what, we'll let, we'll, we're going to respond. Thank you for your questions. Okay, let's go on. Welcome. Talk about it. Okay. Well, I first want to commend Sam that. Adams because I think that he really made traffic safety a huge priority during his term. We might want to complain about having potholes and no sidewalks, uh, but a lot of the transportation dollars we have focused on having safer intersections. And some of our attempts aren't working very well, like green boxes, they haven't been a huge success. But I definitely think uh, we are working on making sure that our road systems do not promote extremely dangerous fast driving. And that's also coming with a little bit of criticism from the business community because some of this involves building green streets, mm -hmm. some of this involves you know, proposing street maintenance fees and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important that we start raising more money to you know, have more traffic signals at intersections. And we also need to be building extended curbs. We need to be build, bending, uh, building green streets and um, things like that that would also help us you know, work with stormwater. Mm -hmm. but, um, I think that still have huge crisis mm -hmm. when it comes you know, to. Uh, again, on, on yeah. the line, I, I agree with you, and I, I think the bicycle community too is going to yeah. help out with that part quite a bit. And as you know, we've had uh, several fatalities yeah. as far as the bus system and the blind spots and things yeah. of that nature. And so we're going to be spending more time talking about eliminating those blind spots. One thing right that I've been talking about a little bit is uh, Dutch angle curves. It's something that they do in Europe. Okay. And so instead of bicyclists being able to go straight down, mm -hmm. and because that's the big problem, cars have to take a right, mm -hmm. and then you know they, they don't see the bikes because the angle of you know the area of sight right. isn't exactly right. there. And so Dutch angle curb basically is a miniature curb that is outside of mm -hmm. the, the sidewalk curb. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the bicyclist has enough space, and they actually have to take a slight right and then also another slight right to the other side because there's going to be Dutch angle curbs on each side mm -hmm. and it allows cars 
it requires cars to make a bigger turn. That way they will actually see what's next to them and they will slow down if there's a bike coming. Mm -hmm. Good point. I might add to the caller that, uh, you know, like you've, like you've called in to us and asked us about those concerns, your concerns. I would suggest that when you call City Hall, you call City Hall, call the mayor's office first. <laughs> uh, even though a commissioner might be identified as a call, call. But call, <laughs> but call the mayor first because what they will do, they will document it. And then you can, they will identify the person you need to call, and then you call that person. But at least it's documented. So if, so if there's not response from the, from the commissioner, that respected commissioner, trust me, when you call back, uh, you will get some response. And then the other thing is that uh, there's a, within, within, the, within this town, uh, every Wednesday, every Wednesday you have the opportunity, citizens have the opportunity to meet, the, to meet City Hall. And so um, that's open. All you have to do is just uh, call up the mayor's office and say that you like you've got some some concerns, and then they'll give you the, the documents, if you will. You fill them out. They go to city hall. You go down there Wednesday morning. I think it starts about nine o'clock, and you will be listed. You will be given the opportunity to spend. I think it was two minutes, two three, three minutes. minutes, three minutes. You need yeah. three minutes to actually lay it out, and it's broadcast all over. You've got folks all over the place, and you got the entire council right there listening to what your concerns are. So, hey, thanks for the call. Appreciate that very much. So what we'll do now at this point in time, we're going to go on and take a short break, and we'll be back with Cameron. And, and again, hopefully you will call. Give us a call, and then we'll respond to your call. Be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Okay, folks, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. We've been I've been sitting here with Cameron and a very active young man, and we, we're going to we're sort of taking advantage of him because he's <laughs> out there. He's out there, you know. I'm, and so I'm doing my thing too at the same time. But anyway, we've been kind of like talking about issues, and, and we, we welcome your calls uh, on whatever subject matter you want to talk to, whether from a national standpoint, whether it be statewide, or uh, whether it be right here within your own community. So please give us a call. The number is going to be on the screen. And you can just give us a call and, and you intervene. Even if it's something that we're not talking about, you can bring it up, okay? So now let's let's talk about another area. Okay. okay. And uh, it's getting ready to get, I mean, we're in the winter, winter months right now. Yeah. It's going to get cold. And every time we get into the cold, we, we have the traffic situation. That's one thing. <laughs> but we've got a lot of folks that are just sitting out there in the cold, you know, and people trying to figure out, well, what do I do? And, and are we aware of that? And I know United Way is there. Uh, we got Salvation Army, we got Red Cross and whatever, and folks are doling out coats and this, that, and the other, and the like, and the food the, the food the places are open, if you will, and this, that, and the other. Is that anything going to change? Anything going to change this time around? Are you, are you hearing it? Well, what do you, what's your update? Give us an update on well, what's going to happen. Well, I have to say that I'm really happy that Christmas time is in the winter because that's when people are most generous. Oh, is that and okay? And so we can deal with the crisis when people need it the most. Mm -hmm. And I actually just went to a fundraiser last night. It was Project H3. They raised some money for TPI. And What's TPI? What was that? What Transition was that? Projects, Inc. Okay. What, what did they raise the money for? For what? Do what? I'm pretty sure it's for their men's shelter, for their alcohol, drug addiction services, food, mm -hmm. you know, sleeping bags, everything else that TPI mm -hmm. provides, showers. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, general making sure that they have safety net services available. Okay. But um, I have to say that addressing problems in the se season is not going to deal with the systemic problems of homelessness. And so, like what? Um, well, you actually have to create, you know, opportunities for people to find work. You have to find, create opportunities for people to have affordable shelter mm -hmm. and you have to stop criminalizing the issue of homelessness. You actually have to be more focused on the solutions than continuing to find ways to push them one place or the other because in the end you're just circulating them mm -hmm. and you know they're human beings and 
there's nowhere else for them to go until mm -hmm. you create that place just like the same way with employment mm -hmm. no one's going to be able to have a living wage job mm -hmm. until we have zero unemployment mm -hmm. so we actually have to really envision it where there's always a place for someone to go to sleep mm -hmm. and this doesn't have to be you know permanent housing this doesn't have to be a shelter we really need to have an adult conversation about mm -hmm. how do we use our land for the maximum effort and mm -hmm. so that's the reason why i've really been engaged with the people at right to dream too mm -hmm. because they have found ways to use their own resources and work with actual property owners who are in conjunction with their mission and mm -hmm. it's been pretty successful for the past mm -hmm. year they've helped 23 people move into permanent housing to help 17 people find a job there's even been two births two mm -hmm. women gave births inside right. that space right. and these are homeless people that they they reached out to exactly mm -hmm. and it spent a lot less money doing this than a lot of what you know portland and the regional area does when they try to build low-income affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we definitely need a diversity of tactics. Mm -hmm. I don't think one way is the best way to go, but we can't shut ourselves out of different opportunities that we can to address the problem. 12 years ago, City of Portland did it with the help of Randy Leonard, Eric Stinn, and a few others when they had Dignity Village. And this is pretty much just another reemergence of that, considering that we just had to deal with an economic crisis, you know, four years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that we once again have to realize that we've helped out 60 people mm -hmm. and it didn't cost us too much at all, about 200 grand. Mm -hmm. And now these people showed up and they're doing it all by themselves. Mm -hmm. So how can we negotiate a way for them to feel like they can be active, mm -hmm. can take care of themselves, and we're not obstructing that. Well, I'll tell you what, well, first off, why don't, we, why don't you bring that group on? <laughs> uh, bring, bring them yeah, on I can do so that. we can just kind of educate the public about who they are, where are they, and when do, when you hit, approach them and how do you support them from the standpoint of monetary support. Uh, some of the things that you said, for instance, like I, Randy was right. Rand, Randy, uh, you know, he actually put those um, those uh, 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 the trains or whatever out in the loos. The loos, right? Yeah. Yeah, these, these are, are restrooms, right? And they're yeah. pretty good. They're working pretty they're good. They're brilliant. They're brilliant? Yeah. And this was brought up by Randy Leonard. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, now he's getting ready to give it up. You know, he has paid his dues. I got yeah. the man. And that's a tough job. But it, it took a it took a Randy Leonard. But but Novak's going to probably take his seat <laughs> to a certain degree, I think. You know? Yeah. The other thing you brought up that, I, that, that came up to my, that came to mind with me was that fact that uh, community policing, you know, mm -hmm. police are out there every day. They know who these people are. They know when they come up to these folks, blah, blah, blah. But I noticed what I what came, up, what came up with was that in New York, just recently, a New York policeman went out and bought some shoes. Yeah, I heard about that. And so that yeah. bought some shoes for a person, a homeless person that was sitting out there with no, no shoes. And he said, basically chatted with him initially, and he said, well, they, I chatted with the guy, and, and, you know, he said, I, I don't have any shoes, you know, and it was cold. And he just went into the store and bought some shoes and gave it to him. I mean, that, it hit the national news. But again, that to me is another mm -hmm. way of, of uh, reaching out. We and have a it, personal story. I have an anecdote but that happened get, in but, Portland. But, but that's an yeah. opportunity because yeah. I, I thought about it initially. I said, well, look, these are the guys that are out there looking at those folks. The only thing you hear about are the negative things, the bad side. You know, boom, uh, homeless person pulls out a knife person gets shot or this, that, and the other. But the bottom line is that they're there, they know these folks and whatever. Look like to me that group could possibly work with them from the standpoint yes. that, yes, they could call them and say, hey, I got a person over here that's having some problems, et cetera, et cetera, no place to go in this, there, and there. there's this number, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Here's the person, bang, come on out. Yeah. And they could send somebody out there, check them out. Or if not, they drop them off somewhere at, at this facility, what you guys had, we put together. You got a person there, what's up? What, what's your personal? Did you say you had, a, you had something? Oh, the personal anecdote. Yeah. Um, there's a, a police officer who I'm enamored with who um, I had a, a friend who was a part of the Occupy movement named Squirrel. Okay. And he actually had, yeah, he used to serve French press coffee to everybody when they were outside in the rain demonstrating. Okay. And one of the police officers accidentally smashed it. And another police officer decided to come to a general assembly and bought Squirrel a completely new French really? press. Yeah. Portland police. Yeah. See that, but no one hears about that. Exactly. No one hears about that. Say it well, one more was, time. He, he wanted to be anonymous. What? Who? Squirrel? No, the police officer. Oh, the police officer? Yes. Well, no. I mean, no. That that's yes, something yes. that needs to be out there. To let people know. In fact, I, I would. I agree with you. I think that we focus too much on just cajoling people, and we yeah. don't really 
try to magnify what we like mm. the best about what people do in their actions. And I feel like, especially when it comes to reforms, mm -hmm. we don't focus enough on what's good. And that's what allows us to continue fighting over the bad issues. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really just basic sociology. Mm -hmm. If you make sure that people feel like they're doing certain things right, they're going to keep doing those right, things. Right, right, but if right. you just make them feel like they're negative, they're not going to care about your right, opinion. Right, right, right. Well, you know, when you think about that, when you make the point about police, see, a lot of folks don't realize that, you know, in that Occupy situation, downtown aspect of it, this wasn't something they just did on their own. No. Yeah. Someone assigned them, told them, say, look, I want you to go out there and enforce these laws. I.e. starts off with no. the mayor. Want right? you to not enforce these yeah, laws. Yeah, or, whatever, or whatever. But my yeah. point is that this is not something they just take on themselves yeah. and say, I'm just going to go out here and just, just stop these folks from doing this, that, yeah. the other, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to know that. Otherwise, it's just kind of like a situation where they say, well, they're just doing what they want to do. No. Somebody up here, it was their boss that basically told them to go out there and do this. I.e., hmm? representing the people, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So let, let's start again a little bit more. Let, we, we start off by talking about um, it's getting ready to get cold and people are going to be out there. We're talking about facilities. Are there enough facilities out there where people can actually no. go? There's no. not enough facilities? No. Do they, are they having discussion now? Is there someone at City Hall? Or is there someone? Where, where do you go? Have they had a summit? Have they talked about this idea before it happened? We just had a summit on homelessness about, you know, three weeks ago, mm -hmm. and um, it was right before Thanksgiving, and we talked about what the face of homelessness looks right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we mostly talked about the demographics, okay. and we kind of talked about how we have this perception of what homelessness is, but we realized that, you know, a huge population lives downtown, but we're ignoring a large amount of population that's in Southeast Portland and East Portland, and a lot of these people our families with children. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people who've ha recently had jobs and either can't afford to pay rent anymore or recently got laid off and they don't have any opportunities anymore. And so we really talked about, well, need is even more. This is, this is How are we going to put up? Okay, now who was sitting at the table? We had representatives from Multnomah County, Clackamas County, Washington County. Um, Dick Shouten okay. from Washington County was okay. there. Troll Anderson, who is the director of uh, Clackamas Housing Authority, was there. Okay, okay. We also had Sam Chase from Metro, who was a convener. Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon was there. David Leslie was the host. And it was really a positive dialogue. Actually, We Are Oregon crashed the summit. <laughs> oh, really? In the middle of the summit, everybody's sitting around listening to our panelists. Mm -hmm. And they come in with bullhorns. Really? And they talk Why? about because they had a, a press conference at 9 a.m. at City Hall, and they realized, wait, the mayor and city council and everybody else is over here at this church having this forum. And so they decided that they were going to go, come oh, pay us a visit. And they talked they, about— Were they a part of the deal? Were they given the opportunity to, uh, to address the issues? They were allowed to speak as long as they wanted to, and it Good. was really interesting. Good. And they pretty much brought a very interesting viewpoint, saying, well— we actually do have shelter that we could provide to everybody. Okay. Um, we've been putting a lot of people who've been foreclosed on back into their homes. Mm -hmm. And these people, really, they've been fighting to try to renegotiate their loans. But considering that no bank is claiming ownership, it's mostly been the mortgage, you know, electronic retirement system, uh, uh. which the state of Washington recently ruled that, you know, they can't foreclose mm -hmm. on people because they're not loaners. Mm -hmm. But anyways, they've been bringing up a lot of issues with, the way our housing market works. Mm -hmm. And there's no way for people who can't afford attorneys to keep themselves inside of their homes, even if they could pay for right. a different amount on their mortgage. Mm -hmm. And after that, you know, they, a lot of people, you know, were silent and it was really beautiful also to see there was a mixture of applause. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people, they're still not open to listening to different opinions on the way our society is functioning. Mm -hmm. But I think the most remarkable thing after that happened was, Deborah Kafori, city uh, county commissioner, mm -hmm. she stood up and she talked about the previous week where the unanimously the Multnomah County Board decided to join on a lawsuit against the mortgage electronic retirement system because they pretty much have not been following Oregon procedure mm -hmm. in paying for, you know, re uh, registration, yeah, registration fees. Mm -hmm. So there's filing fees whenever you 
move your title over to somebody else mm -hmm. and nobody knows exactly what MERS is doing mm -hmm. and it's obvious that the banks who have these titles initially don't no longer has these titles and so they're obviously not paying something and so mm -hmm. we're really acknowledging that we have a huge problem with our housing market and I think that everybody understands that and we're all gonna try to work together to mm -hmm. Deal with that problem. You know, as you were talking about, about I asked you about uh, who's at the table aspect of it. I didn't hear you mention about the housing authority of Portland. I mean, were they there? Um, City. The housing bureau was there. I don't think anybody from Home Forward was well, actually. Well, the housing there. authority of Portland. You know, they're sort of a landlord. You know, they own they their houses yeah. and whatever. Yeah. That's that's an interesting. They weren't there. The other thing is that the established groups, like for instance, uh, Salvation Army, the Red Cross, United Way. I mean, yeah. these are major yeah. organizations aspect. Were they at the table? Yeah. Okay. Say, so, you know, I, I make that point because at one point in time I was... Join was there. Who was there? Join was there. Join. Um, Human Solutions was there. But the, but the, but the other majors were not there. Yeah, I don't think they were there. That, that's interesting because United Way, when you think about it, I mean, that is one of the major, major fundraising aspects of it. We have this, this time period and employers and all kinds of folks are there. I, at one point in time, I used to work at United Way. And I was responsible for the education arena and, and industrial in Clackamas. And, and the whole idea of the agency was that, um, the whole part of the agency was that if there was an issue within a certain area, they would bring it to this board. And then they would, they would look at it, and then basically they would either create something to, to resolve that issue aspect of it. And so that's why folks were encouraged to, to send their monies, if you will, and uh, to, to give it up to the United Way. And uh, that's what they're supposed to do. And, and so, uh, because my point is that there are a lot of folks, you know, they, they don't know just who to give and where to give it. You know what I mean? Where, where do I give this blanket? Where do I take this blanket? Uh, you know, is my fifth, if, if I've given up $50. What did it do? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, what were the results of that $50 that I put out there on the table aspect of it? So I think we, we need to have a discussion, you know, and, and those, those major organizations need to be sitting at the table because they're the one that gets most of the money. Got me? Most mm -hmm. cases, the folks that are you talking about, these are just little folks that are doing a daily, 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 daily routine. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, these are, and these are supposed to fund these individuals mm -hmm. to actually respond to the issues that these folks that are on the on the ground, if you will, that are seeing these issues. Mm -hmm. Fair? You know, one thing I want to point out, I've been volunteering for the past three years yeah. at Portland Homeless Family Solutions with okay. the Kings Hollow Family Shelter. And something they recently established uh, they call the Village Support Network. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of the families, which they are help to transition out of their family shelter and into permanent housing, they try to work with neighbors in their community to be a support for that person to make sure that they are on the right track and they're getting everything they need to get done. And I think that people can really take a stronger prerogative and maybe work with their local church or work, work with their neighbors and really put in the extra effort to work directly with some of these at-risk communities and you develop some relationships because we can't always say, this nonprofit's gonna take my money and they have to do everything right. They have to do what I want them to do. Mm -hmm. You just take your money and you do with it what you wanna do mm -hmm. and make it have that benefit. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take a little bit more effort, but I think that you will have much more of a rewarding feeling. But there, there, that opportunity exists. I know it exactly. existed at United yeah. Way. The idea is that anybody could come up. If there was an issue, they were supposed to address that issue for hungry, for food, for housing, and anything of that nature. Because even at the banks, for instance, I know that U.S. Bank, when I was there too at one point in time, I mean, it, it was spending all kinds of money, sending all kinds of money to United Way, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, and uh, Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. all your major institutions. So when you start thinking about the real estate and this, that, and the other, you would think, okay, fine. And United Way would sit down, they would always talk about this issue and say, okay, fine, let's come up with some, a solution to resolve this issue. I mean, let them get involved in the process and then get to the banks. Because the banks say, hey, we got a problem here. I mean, our policy is this way. We got, we got uh, whatever, you know, investors and this, that, and the other. But the fact is, we're giving you monies to see what's going on over here so we can solve the problem. So get it done. Here's the money. Go get it done. But so something needs to happen along that particular line. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to, they need to be at that table. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. U.S. Bank. Uh, not U.S. Bank, but United Way, Red Cross, Salvation Army, those are the big major three, if you will, should be at the table. If, if anything, they should be leading, if you will, the charge and get into these small outfits, if you will, and solving these problems, okay? And the same thing with the, with the department, the police department. They, they need to outreach to the department and say, okay, fine, 
uh, look, uh, uh, when you find a person that's not, that needs housing or, or this or clothing or this, then call this number. Call this number. And here's the person. Let them go out and visit the jails, if you will, and, and be sitting up there when the judge is talking to this person. If, if the person is a homeless person, respond to that situation. Anyway, just a thought. Because we are getting into the point where we're going to have some cold days here coming up, and, and we're all sensitive about that. We're all, we're all a human, and we want to make sure that people are not uh, living out in the cold and living under the bridges and things of that nature. But the agencies are going to have to respond because the folks that are out there who are nice and warm in this area, they give monies to these organizations to respond to those issues. We should not have any homeless in, the, in, in our community. Yep. There's too much money that's being given to these organizations, yep. respectively. Yep. Okay, So I would hope that you might be able to get those folks to, let's, let's have a little summit right here on the Oregon Voters Digest. Bring that lead person or whatever, and we can sit down. You can do the show. You can, be the, you okay. can, you, you can go on and take the lead on that piece and, and, and educate the public. And maybe find one commissioner, maybe like a Novak or something like that, and get him to sit down here. He he'll jump on that big time, wouldn't you think? Maybe <laughs> he, he's going to be the new Randy Leonard, yeah, right on the board. I want to call him the new Randy Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one can be Randy Leonard. You know, they, uh, uh, what do you think about Randy? Did he do a good job while he was there? I I think that he Commissioner Leonard, by the way, city city of Portland. Yeah, Commissioner Leonard. I would have to say that. Uh, he's been around for a very long time, and he has his own scrappy style that he likes to portray. Okay. And I relate how Randy Leonard's performed to a lot what happened in Multnomah County about six years ago when you had Diane Lynn and what they like to call the Mean Girls. Mm -hmm. And we had a huge fallout because of, you know, marriage equality, you know, marriage licenses or you know, same-sex marriage licenses as they called them. And after that, you know. The county commission didn't really start working and it was mostly because some people had an agenda where they didn't really care too much about collaboration they didn't prioritize citizen input and doing what is in the best scope of the entire region mm -hmm. and it started becoming a lot more of a narrow vision mm -hmm. and so i think that Randy Leonard has been really loyal to a lot of constituencies that he's represented. Mm -hmm. And I hope that Steve Novick can open up City Hall a little bit more and try to represent everybody to mm -hmm. the best of his ability. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I like that. But I'm putting a lot of pressure on Steve because mm -hmm. I can see Steve. I mean, he's the kind of guy that if he sees the issue, he will just look at the That's his mindset. I mean, that's, that's his training, you know, being a, being a legal person, if you will. That's his training to look at the facts, et cetera, and then run and, and get some response. He, he works on both ends, you know, on the end. Of, now, the other thing I was going to ask you about is that there's another issue here within the area. He talks about the uh, Alabama Ministerial Alliance, you know, mm -hmm. Reverend ba Pastor Bethel, Bethel, and they're very focused on the whole issue of police. Mm -hmm. And I think Joanne Bowman is part mm -hmm. of that, that process. What do you think about that? Now? That's, that's that? frustrating for me. Um, I've been interning lately for the Urban League of Portland, okay. and so I've been really trying to address issues facing the black community. Mm -hmm. And I do not feel that we have coalesced strongly enough about economic justice. Okay. And something that I've really been focusing a lot on is a campaign for affordable housing, mixed income neighborhoods, because we have seen a lot of gentrification impacting our neighborhoods. And it's really sad, especially with you know Vanport happening in the mid-1950s, right, right. where a lot of these people who were segregated trickled out into Portland, were resegregated, mm -hmm. and then once again, it was decided, well, we don't really want, this has become a blight, and right. so we're going to develop this, and you're basically going to be forced to move from your homes. So it's never really been the choice for people of color where they live. Mm, okay. And I've been focusing on this campaign that's been working to repeal the ban on inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that got banned in 1999. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting tool that mostly has been analyzed in Mon uh, Montgomery County of Maryland, okay. where they have been allowing developers to have more freedom with the zoning codes in residential areas in return of having a stronger quota of affordable housing. And so it's been a really unique tool that has not been, you know, taking profits away from people, but it has been working more with our land use laws to help us have 
strong neighborhoods where people of all income levels can access a good school, can access groceries, can access active transportation and have a, a great, you know, mm-hmm. park environment. Mm-hmm. So that's really where I want to see a lot more of our you know, African-American community. I think that we should uh-huh. talk a lot more about the root problem of the issues because policing comes afterwards. We still have to deal with making sure people have opportunities so they don't get into crime or drugs and trafficking and other things like that. And so, well, you know, in all due respect, I, I was a little, I was a little disappointed with uh, with Commissioner Nick Fish because that was his baby, the housing thing aspect of it. And as you know, the discrimination thing, you know, that, that whole issue with discrimination of contractor, yeah, back the to Section the table, Eight, yeah. And uh, he tried to so, sort of suppress it, so to speak, and and to the point they got rid of the contractor, you know. And we still have the issue. And, yeah. And Nick and what I saw was that Nick was kind of responding, if you will, to the business folks. I mean, to the folks who who own the the, yeah. the, the multi-level blah 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 routine. So I would hope that he would uh, maybe get back to the table yeah. and uh, and educate those folks he represents yeah. that that he's paying for, uh, that's paying for him to be there, if you will. But uh, maybe he might be able to come on the show and we can help him out. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe, maybe. Can, maybe you can intern over there. <laughs> you know, that housing, right? Yes. Housing authority of Portland. That's his, that's his baby, so to speak. Well, we got about a minute left or so. Uh, any lasting comments? Stay healthy. Stay healthy. <laughs> As I heard that, I'm saying you're gonna be going back on another diet or something. Or, you yeah, know, fat, you're gonna be people, fasting. People again? have been force feeding me, so. So, so you're gonna be fasting <laughs> again? I don't think fasting. What's your just name? Eating a little well, less. you're interning at the at the Urban League. What else are you doing? I'm, you know, finishing finals. Finishing finals, right? You're yeah. Still in school. Yeah. Okay, good. So what what is what year now? Are you gonna get your social degree here pretty soon? Yeah, I'm planning on transferring. I submitted my information transfer to PSU, PSU? for okay. the winter term. So yeah, hopefully cool. they'll accept me, crossing accept my fingers. Me. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. And I tell you, getting funding. I mean, how you how you how you, how you living, buddy? I've got a boat full of debt. <laughs> boat full of debt? Oh so God. I hope I get a good paying job. Well, I hope I, that those congressmen can fix that budget and well, take care of well, my I, debt. I saw the front so. page of the are going. I saw a lot of folks were graduating and they got a whole bunch of debt. So exactly. You just joined the line, right? I know. I it's frustrating. You. But, but hey, well, but I didn't you, ask for this. You get that piece of paper. I think it's a very important piece. Mm-hmm. Well, folks, we've been, we've spent an hour just talking to um, uh, Cameron here. I think it's been great. I think he's given us a lot of insight. And uh, that's what it's all about. And, you know, and hopefully I hope he'll run next time around and, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll find him some bucks or whatever. But he, I think he would be great uh, as a county commissioner, uh, if not that, a uh, city commissioner or somebody. <laughs> be involved. No. Yeah. But that's what you got to do. You got to pay your dues. And that's what you're yeah. doing. And yeah. I appreciate you doing that. Well, folks, thank you very much for being a part of the Oregon Voters Digest today. Enjoy. Take care. I'll see you next week. And Merry Christmas. I'll start off now. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and have a good one. Okay. Take care.